All right, looking at uh, some questions, and I have a lot of questions in, in the queue, so to speak. And like I said, I'm just going to take, take this as far as I can and, uh, and then just with an eye on the clock. But uh, uh, the questions, I had, uh, had two questions about baptism and two questions about elders came in in the last couple of weeks. And so I've combined those two together. The first question, actually it's two questions in a single, in a single uh, message, says, can a woman baptize? And then the second question is, can a person baptize himself? And so we'll deal with those in that, in that order. It says, can a woman baptize? Now, you've heard me say many, many, many times that the Bible places absolutely no conditions or restrictions on the administrator of baptism. Is that right? Is that what the Bible says? All right. So if, I mean, this could be a very short answer, all right? But, you know, if the Bible places absolutely no conditions or restrictions on who can baptize, then the answer to that question would then be what? Yes, that a woman could baptize. Now, we don't have any, we, again, we don't have any example of women administering baptism in the New Testament. But, uh, but obviously there are, there are a number of reasons for that. But uh, uh, if, there, if there are no restrictions or conditions, then there are no restrictions or conditions. Uh, but let me, let me just go to another point, and this goes back to my earliest days at East Wood Street in uh, Paris, Tennessee. We moved there in December of 93. And about that time, there was a magazine that began to be published in the Brotherhood by the name of Wineskins. And Wineskins was a far left publication. It was, it was uh, the, the editors, the writers were all Look, it, it, as we'd say it, among us, they were all liberals. Every single one of them. Uh, Brother Woodson referred to them, and they even referred to themselves as change agents. They were seeking to change the Lord's church in a number of ways. And even, the, even in, the, in the inaugural issue of that magazine, they made the statement that they are trying to take the big C Church of Christ and move it closer to the little C Church of Christ that you see in the Bible. As if the Church of Christ that we know is different than the Church of Christ that's in the New Testament. Which obviously I outright reject that premise. But that just gives you the mindset of those individuals. It wasn't long. I don't, I don't remember what issue it was, but I've seen it. There was an issue. The cover of, and by the way, Wineskins was a really nice publication. I'm talking about high gloss, high, you know, heavy paper on the cover in the back and I mean it was really well produced and on the cover were two women in the process of baptizing another woman and that was on the cover now again there's nothing in the Bible that would pre you know prevent that but when you when you know when you know the mindset of the people that are producing the publication you know what they're trying to do is they're trying to push the envelope. It wasn't just about, it wasn't just about two women. About, they were like on a mission trip. I think they were in the Ukraine. They'd studied with this woman. They were the only people who had ever studied with this woman. And, and according to them, and I wouldn't put it past them to lie, but according to them, they said that she specifically requested those women to baptize her. Again, which is fine. But there, it, there, was a, there was a push by this group for, for example, for expanded roles of women in the work and worship leadership of the church. In other words, you know, was this photograph, which was perfectly legit, was being used as an impetus for a more sinister agenda. And there is, there is for lack of a better term, the idea of perceived authority as opposed to actual authority. Now, what I mean by that is that we can perceive an individual has authority when, in fact, there is no authority being exercised. And that's, that goes, for example, with uh, uh, there was a big hullabaloo about 20 years ago in the Brotherhood about could women serve as translators? Like if you go overseas and say you went to Russia or you went to China or you went somewhere where most people did not speak English, could you... Could you use a woman to translate your preaching and your teaching? And, you know, is that about, you know, is the woman teaching, you know, is, is she the authority? And, of course, I always believe that the translator has no authority. None. 
The translator only says what the person tells them to say, right? And you know, and for example, let's just say, let's just say that I was here and I didn't speak y'all's language. All right? And uh, but Rhonda and I are married and Rhonda does speak your language, all right? We'll just call it language XYZ. And I don't speak XYZ, but Rhonda speaks XYZ. And I'm te- I'm here to teach. And so I stand up here and I'm preaching and Rhonda is translating what I say into X, Y, Z. Now, if anybody obeyed the gospel, who would they say taught them the gospel? Me or Rhonda? Me. Because what Rhonda Rhonda said was what I said. In other words, she didn't say anything that originated with her and she was not exercising any authority over the people that she was teaching. I was the teacher. I was the, in other words, I was the originator of the message. But that, but that came into the argument of real versus perceived authority. And I just, I, I just never bought the idea that, that women's translators were a problem because they are, that, because they are, not, they are not the authority. The speaker, the speaker is, is the authority. And, and that... By the way, and when people listen to a translator, the original speaker is still perceived as the authority. For example, uh, when two heads of state meet and they don't speak the same language, they have what's called uh, instantaneous translation. In other words, let's say the president of the United States is sitting and he's talking to another head of state. As he's talking, there's people that can do this. They can translate as they're hearing in this ear, they can translate simultaneous. All right. They don't have to wait for the president to speak and stop and talk. They can. It's instantaneous translation. Now, when one head of state is talking to another head of state, do either heads of state believe that the authority is in the person who's doing the translating, or is it in the person that that, that they are translating? You see. And so I thought I thought this was I, I thought the matter uh, and believe the matter of baptism in this case could be a real versus perceived authority issue. And, and by the way, this is going to be, you're going to hear more and more about this, I'm afraid, uh, because uh, one of the arguments that I continue to hear all the time is, um, can women wait at the Lord's, can women assist at the Lord's table? Can they assist at the Lord's table? You know, what does, you know, what, you know, say, you have two people here that are presiding, you have this person here, and you have this person here, and assuming, you know, that that these two people on the outside never say a word, are they exercising any authority? No. There's no authority. There's no authority in, hand, in, in, in taking a plate and handing it to somebody. Because we don't practice closed communion. You don't get to, in other words, whoever's at the table doesn't choose who they're going to give the plate to, right? But if you put two women up here on the outside, it gives the perception of authority, right? And see, I, I and I would have a big problem with that, even though technically there's no real authority being exercised. There's a perceived authority. So back to the question: Can women baptize? Absolutely, they can. There's nothing in the Bible that forbids it. Uh, given the choice, what would I do? And that's what I put here. You know, given the choice, what would I do? Well, the first thing I would do is if I if I was somewhere and I realized I need to be baptized for remission of my sins. I'd try to find the very first person I'd get my hands on near a body of water. That's what I would do. You know, kind of like the eunuch. You know, as soon as the eunuch realized he needed to be baptized, when the water was there, here's water, what hinders me to be baptized? Now look, given the choice between a man or a woman, I would choose a man. For a couple of reasons. Number one, real versus perceived authority. Uh, uh, Secondly, you know, Men are stronger as a general rule than women. So, you know, you have that. But, but so far as would it be wrong for a woman to baptize, the answer is no. Yes, ma'am. So, are you going to cause trouble? <laughs> I mean, I've never heard of this. Never heard of what? A woman baptizing someone. No, I haven't either until I saw that on wineskins. Uh, oh, all right. Let me, all right, let me, all right, let me explain. Let me explain. 
in, and I didn't explain it well enough. In the situation as described on that cover in the Ukraine, those two women taught that lady, and she supposedly asked them to baptize her based on the fact that they had taught her. All right? I'm talking about like here. If it were here, right I, because, of the, because, of the, because of perceived authority, it I would be, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. It would be lawful, but not expedient. In 1 Corinthians 18, Paul said, all things are lawful, but all things are not expedient. In other words, it's not the best way to do a thing. I don't even see that. Well, that's fine. But if it is... I don't see any examples in the Bible. I understand that. I understand that. But do you find any prayer in the Bible that specifies who and who, who can and who cannot baptize? Well, and the answer to that... say that for a lot of things. I understand. Yeah. The question is, does the Bible speak to any degree about importance in any respect on who baptizes you? I need you to answer my question. Okay. So the answer to my question is no. Because and so if the answer is no, then the answer is still no. There are other things that we explicitly uh, I, say there is no example for that and we don't do it. I understand. Okay. I understand. But no, I understand what you're saying, but that's not correct. There are examples of things that are not binding. But there are not examples of things that we say would be wrong for us to do them. Well, if it's perfectly fine, why are, why are we not seeing anyone do it? Because of the matter of real versus perceived authority. We under, if, somebody, if, if somebody was visiting and saw this, they would get the wrong. Right. Wrong. Somebody would certainly. You can't have that. Right. It, it's the matter of expediency. Expediency is the best way to do a thing. If I'm out in the middle of nowhere and I need to be baptized, I want the first person that can get their hands on me to, be, to baptize me. If I'm in this assembly and there's 20 capable men, I mean phys there's 20 physically capable men, one of those guys is going to administer that baptism. Right. Right. But again... Again, it's the matter of real versus perceived authority. There's no difference. Now listen, there's no difference in a person standing up here and handing it to Ann and Ann handing it to Faye. They've both done the exact same thing. Somebody's handed the plate to Ann and Ann has handed the plate to Faye. And Faye has handed it to Rhonda and Rhonda may just turn around and hand it to Mueller. All five of them have done the exact same thing. None of them has exercised authority over the other one. None of them has exercised any authority over the other one. But again, when you start doing things like this, it's the matter of perceived authority. And when you start, when you start uh, entering into the area of, of um, confusing gender roles, for lack of a better term, that seems to be a common phraseology nowadays. <laughs> When you start dealing with the matter of confusing gender roles, then you start running into it's not expedient. And if it's not expedient, it's a problem. If it's something that, is, that unnecessarily creates a stumbling block for another person, it becomes a problem. Like Paul said, if eating meat causes my brother to stumble, I'll not eat meat as long as the world stands. Paul was perfectly free to eat meat or not eat meat. He says, but if it creates a problem, I'm not going to do it. And th thus, in our case, in this particular case, what we're talking about either standing up here or baptizing, it's going to create a problem. It's going to create a stumbling block, and it's going to create confusion. It's going to create confusion, especially, you know, especially in the minds of our young people. Yeah, it, would create, it could create confusion. And so, and so the answer to the question is, yes, they can, but sometimes you say there are things that you can do, but should you? And I, in that case, I would say the answer in our situation would be no. Would be no. I mean, like, if you went on a mission trip, you remember Miss Ruth Orr? Yeah, I'm not talking about that. Okay, but, yeah. But here, here was, you know, in other words, where you are also plays a big part in that. Yeah.
songs, leading prayers. And if it Speaking. was Sunday, we could do the Lord's Supper if there were no men here. That's right. We could do everything, and I could baptize somebody. But I can't see if there's a man. Right. They should, we should not be doing the Lord's right. Supper. Right. We should not be yeah, baptizing. I understand, and you're right, teaching. and you're right. But, but the, the question is, can a woman do it? And the answer to that question is, yes, she can, but not should, you know, should she? What if a man's present is not a Christian? Well, that, that'd be a different ball game altogether. Because if you had an assembly, if, for example, uh, uh, if you had an assembly of, of, of women and they met every Lord's Day, and yet for some reason some non-Christian man walks in, he ain't preaching. He ain't praying. He's not, you know, he's not leading in the worship, and 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 that would be it. That would be a, yeah. You're talking about two different kind of situations there. A man that's not a Christian is not the same as a man, obviously, who is one. All right. Now the second question was, may a man, or may a person baptize themselves, and that's that question is, no. Because. What you find in the New Testament is that baptism is an act is is an act of submission, where a person submits to the act itself, and so there has to be an administrator. You know, the first question was who may be the administrator. The second question is our issue surrounds there has to be an administrator, and, and that the person has to submit to baptism to be buried. And to be raised. And, you know, a person cannot, you know, they, you cannot bury and raise, you cannot bury and raise yourself in the sense that, you know, Christ was dead and buried. And then, obviously, God raised him from the dead. Uh, you know, the, 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 passive, the passive nature uh, that, that baptism represents, it, you know, there's a dead person going into the water. You know, it's a dead person being buried, and thus a dead, and then raised up in newness of life. And so, there's a, there's a difference in do you have to have an administrator as opposed to who may be the administrator? Right. Yeah. You have. To, yeah. You have to have a. Conf I mean, yeah. All that's involved. Yeah. I didn't even. Think, I didn't even go back that far, Lisa. But that's exactly right. You know, there's a there's a confession that has to be made. Uh, before you know, at least in the presence of at least one witness, you know, to in order for a person to be baptized, you know, you have to confess that Jesus is the Lord, or sometimes we say that He's the Son of God, and so and so that would also require a, a second party uh, to be to be present, and so uh, one may not may, one may not baptize himself. All right, now. The second set of questions uh, pertains to the matter of, of elders. And uh, by the way, I don't know if y'all know this or not, but uh, today is May the 22nd, all right? May the 23rd was the day that the current eldership was installed. So we've been elders exactly 365 days, if you count the day we were appointed. So we've been elders for one year. Technically, be the one year the anniversary would be tomorrow. And, uh, and so... I just I just thought it was interesting that I got questions about the eldership during the week that that three of us served as elders for exactly one year uh, together and and this question and I don't have any idea who asked this question that uh, and they sent it to me and they know who I am but because I don't have their number I don't know who they are all right and so and, and I wanted to qualify that because whoever asked me the question is probably watching this or is going to watch it. And so I have no idea who sent me this question. And the question is, when elders are not scripturally qualified, is it wrong to leave that congregation with the idea that I cannot serve under a false eldership? Um, and my first, my first response to that is, is that we have to be careful in making a determination that men are not qualified to serve as elders. Because I've heard people make arguments that men are not qualified to serve as elders when what it boils down to is they disagree with the decision that the elders have made. You know, and just because a person disagrees with a decision that the elders have made doesn't mean that those, that, 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 that eldership is unqualified. Secondly, 
even if it can be determined at some later point in time that the elder's decision was the wrong one. <laughs> and by the way, if we serve as, you know, you know if Philip and John, now Lynn's been an elder for 20 years, all right? Lynn will have to speak for himself, all right? But, you know, if, if Philip and John and I served 20 years together, like Lynn has served 20 years, I think it'd be safe for us to say that at some point in 20 years, we're going to have made the wrong decision. I mean, I would never presume that any eldership made the right decision 20, 20 years without any missteps. Now, just because it wasn't the best decision or could have been the wrong decision doesn't mean it was a sinful decision, right? And being, you know, by the way, that's the way, that's the reason you have an eldership so that you can have more than one head working together to try to make the very best decision that you can make. But I would say again, you know, you know, you check back with me in 2042. You know, in 2042, and if, and if I'm still alive and Philip's still alive and John's still alive, Lynn, you'll be what? About 90? Lynn says he ain't going to be here. <laughs> All right, be, just be on us. All right, Lynn says he's out. All right, but you check back with us in 20 years and, ask, and you ask us if we always made the right decision, I think we'd be unanimous to say, no, we haven't always made the right decision. And it could be the case that we made a wrong decision. Rather than making the less than best decision, it could be the case we make a wrong decision. But it wouldn't mean that we made a sinful decision. And by the way, even when elders sin, it doesn't quite disqualify them. Because 1 Timothy 5 says, The elders that sin rebuke before all that others may also fear. In other words, elders are not, number one, elders are not above sinning. They're not above being rebuked. They're not above being corrected. But that still doesn't disqualify them from being elders. I mean, Peter was an apostle and he committed a pretty egregious sin, right? Right? And not just one. I mean, he committed, I mean, we think about the sin of Peter, we always think about the denial, right? Man, you read Galatians chapter 2, and Paul confronted Peter to his face because he played the hypocrite against the Gentile Christians. He said, when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. That's a pretty serious matter, right? Didn't disqualify him from being an apostle. And it didn't disqualify him from being an elder because Peter also served as an elder, 1 Peter 5, 1 to 4. And so the first thing I would want, first thing I would caution about is, is, again, because I don't know who's asked this question, so I don't know who it's being asked about, is I would be careful about throwing out the disqualification, uh, the disqualification accusation because it might not be so. It might not be so. Uh, if there, was, if there was a case where it could be uh, demonstrably proven that an, elder, that an elder was not qualified, then that, in my opinion, would be a matter that would need to be taken to the eldership. Let's just say, let's just say at some point in time that I became, I became unqualified to serve as an elder. All right? Rather than one of y'all leaving because you think or know that I'm unqualified... I would hope that you would come to me and the rest of the elders and let the elders handle that thing. And hopefully if, if I was unqualified, I'd have enough integrity to just step down. To just step down. If, if I asked to step, if I asked to step, by the way, I said that from the day I was appointed. That if it ever became a problem for me to be an elder, I'd step down because, you know, this church is bigger than one person and, and the Lord's work is bigger than one person. And, you know, I've been here 26 years and I didn't have to be an elder and I don't have to be an elder going forward. And so you, you would hope that an individual would have enough integrity to step down. And, and if they wouldn't, then the, elder, the other elders would need to ask that individual to step down. But again, it would have to be something that was, that was proven. And so I have, I, have a, I have an issue with the idea of just throwing a blanket statement that the entire eldership is disqualified or not scripturally qualified and again look and i'm not saying that every eldership out there is qualified i'm not saying that at all i'm not saying every elder is qualified but i, I would be really careful before before i would just painted the whole eldership as being scripturally 
unqualified. And I think that the biblical thing to do is to work within the confines of the present eldership rather than just, you know, get my ball and go somewhere else. I, I, don't, I, don't, think that's, I don't think that's ever... I don't think that's ever the right thing to do. I mean, I think you exhaust every possible effort. Because look, you know, we're a family, right? We're a family. I mean, we're a congregation, but we're a family. Therefore, we want what's best for everybody that's in the family. You know, and not everybody in my family makes me happy all the time. But I don't just pack up and go find me another one. Yeah. There's no reason that you should ever leave here unless it was easier to go somewhere else. Yeah, you know, if this church started teaching false doctrine and the eldership started practicing false doctrine, you'd still have an obligation to try to, to c correct it. And if when all options are exhausted, then go somewhere else. Then go somewhere else. But, it, you know, if this is your church family, you know, we want everybody to go to heaven. And if something's going on that would cause somebody not to go to heaven, then we're going to. We're going to do our very best to, to prevent that, all right? And so, and so I guess the answer to the question would be yes, but I'd be really careful about, about designating an eldership as being scripturally unqualified and whatnot, and I think it has to be worked out within the confines of the local church and then, and then go, go forward. Uh, then this question is also from the eldership, and I, this will be the last one because I will have, and I'm going to have to do it in a hurry because it's just a shade after 6 o'clock. Um, it says, why were there so many head elders in the 2nd and 3rd century? Now, if you know anything about church history, you know that one of the earliest apostasies from the truth was in the matter of church organization. And by the way, Paul, Paul forewarned the elders at Ephesus of this. He said, Take heed to yourselves and all the flock over the which the Holy Spirit hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he's purchased with his own blood. For I know this, after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in, not sparing the flock. Even from among your own selves shall men rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. That's Acts 20, 28 to 31. And so we know for a fact that Paul warned that problems in the church would early on, would begin in the eldership. And that departures from the truth would begin in the eldership, in the leadership. Uh, I took some quotes. I took some quotes from some of the early, what we call the Antonicene fathers the, in, the, in the hundred years following the close of the New Testament. Uh, this, and this statement says, in the didash, which means the teaching, uh, dated somewhere between the year 80 and the year 140, it says, appoint for yourselves bishops and deacons worthy of the Lord. So in this, in this document, it talks about bishops and deacons in the, in the biblical way. Okay, uh, Clement of Rome wrote, uh, the apostles appointed the first fruits of their labors to be bishops and deacons. That's about the year 96. Clement of Rome, if, it, if it's accurate, was a contemporary of the apostle Paul. You can read about him in Philippians 4 verse 3. Uh, and so Clement of Rome writes about bishops and deacons in the sense in which the Bible speaks. But Ignatius also wrote about that time, around the end of the first or early second century. Now listen to what Ignatius writes. Be subject to the bishop and presbyters. Do you see the difference there? The bishop and presbyters. In other words, there's one... And then there's a group. He wrote, Obey the bishop and the presbyters with an undivided mind. Let us be careful to ourselves. Let us be careful not to find ourselves in opposition to the bishop. We should look upon the bishop even as we would the Lord himself. Your bishop presides in the place of God and the presbyters in the place of the assembly. Do nothing without the bishop. And so here we are at the end of the first century, early part of the second century, and Ignatius is writing in terms that in a church there, is, there are elders and there's a bishop. Now, that's beginning to mimic what we, what we know as Roman Catholicism. Because you began with an eldership, which is the Lord's plan, 
And then you ended up with elders or presbyters. That's the word for elders, presbyters. You had presbyters or elders, and then you had a chief of them, and he got the title of bishop, even though the Bible says they're all the same thing. You had a bishop. So the bishop was the head over the church, and the, and the presbyters were there. Well, then, in a gathering of churches, you had a group of bishops, and the most influential one began to be the archbishop. And he was the bishop over the bishops, and the bishops were over the elders. And you start seeing, you start seeing this hierarchy being built that eventually was a perfect mirror of Roman government with the Caesar and the Senate, you know, the Caesar and the Senate, and then the governors. In other words, the Roman government was built with one man at the top and then kind of a pyramid going out. What does Roman Catholicism look like? The Pope, the cardinals, the archbishops, the bishops, the priests. I mean, they, they've got it. In other words, but you, you, can put, you can put those two side by side and see how that began to, to mirror one another. And, and then, and I'm running out of time, but we say, how, how in the world could this happen in the year 100? How could this, how could this happen so soon after the close, after the close of, of the writing of the apostles? Well, let me ask you a question. How was it that within five years the Corinthians began to deny the resurrection? I mean, that church hadn't been in existence five years and there's already a group of people in Corinth denying the resurrection of the dead. They, they were tolerating fornication. You know, man had his father's wife. There was all types of fornication. The Thessalonian church dealt with fornication among the brethren. Uh, the book of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3, the prophetess Jezebel teaches my servants to eat things sacrificed to idols and commit fornication. I mean, from the earliest days of the church, there began to be departures. And with this particular one about, about uh, 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 church organization, what did James and John want when they talked to Jesus? We want to be at your right hand and your left hand. What did they want? place of prominence, to be over people. You know, how many times did Jesus have to rebuke His apostles for arguing about who's going to be the greatest? Right? What about, uh, what about Diotrephes in the book of 3 John? The Bible says he loves to have preeminence among the brethren. It's always been, it's always been in the carnal heart of man to be important and to find some place of authority to exercise authority. So it would only be natural. It would only be... By the way, again, I know I'm running out of time. Elderships sometimes have singular elders who really rule over an eldership. I've seen it. You might have five elders, but there's one man who really holds sway over the entire group. And I've seen it in a number of places. Four elders, five elders, six elders. Sometimes one man, for whatever reason, seems to be looked at as kind of a, a head above the rest. And if he's not careful, he can, let that, he can let that be persuasive to him, right? Again, it's only natural for people to want to, to, to be there. And so, and so uh, you know, that, why? Well, the, the Bible forewarned of these things. And number two, it's just, it, again, it's in the carnal, in the carnal minds and heart of men to, to conduct themselves. That way, so that's that's the reason. That's the reason why. All right, I'm gonna turn this off. And I got my truck parked. I'm gonna get out of here. And I'm gonna ask Kyle.